This is a video about New Zealand, but before we begin, we need to take a slight detour. This is China, and so is this, and this, and this, and this. We have spent the past five and a half years exploring every nook and cranny of this ancient country, learning Chinese, and getting to grips with its ever so varied history. Now you might assume that having navigated our way across rural China, we would feel like experienced and knowledgeable travelers, ready to dive headfirst into any country we visit. But you'd be wrong. You see, after a few days spent traversing our way through New Zealand's stunning North Island, we realized, well, we'd only been skimming the surface and had not dug nearly as deep as we could during our time in China. But everything changed when we reached Rotorua. This is Tracy, and she made it her mission to help us understand the story of this magnificent bunch of islands idly floating in the southwestern Pacific Ocean. What do you think are some misconceptions about Maori culture? Some think we still live in grass houses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had someone turn up and they go, oh, I don't realise you guys had houses. If you see people, they mm -hmm. will want to tell you their stories. Yeah, there's Because some... it's been passed down in our families. As you probably already guessed, Tracy, the owner of the local RV park, is also a proud member of the local Maori community. And as Jack said when we arrived here... We like to learn about the Maori culture. Mm -hmm. So with the help of our local hosts, that is exactly what we're going to do today. There's only one problem though. Jack, being the history nerd he is, has been reading up on Maori culture, but he has no idea how to properly pronounce the local Maori names. So in this video, we will defer this responsibility to our hosts. Muto. Mutu. Mu. As in cow. Mu. Tu. Tu. Toi faka ido. Toi faka ido. So the first thing that you need to know is that, well, although we can't know for sure, the Māori first came from Polynesia to settle New Zealand around the 13th century, although they perhaps visited earlier. So canoes have long had a significance to Māori culture. After all, this was the vessel of choice when they crossed the seas to arrive in New Zealand. Up to 30 of them would cram into a great big seafaring waka. But after a few centuries, during the Little Ice Age, unfortunately the seas became too rough and the temperatures too cold to be nipping across the oceans. So they kind of lost their seafaring abilities. However, canoes still kind of played a vital role in Maori culture. Whether it was crossing the lake or nipping up and down the shores, they helped tribes trade with each other and were a vital, vital tool. A canoe builder was one of the most respected members of a Maori tribe. The second thing you need to know is that the Maori are actually made up of many different tribes, each with their own distinct culture. What tribe are you from? Nati So you don't say the G sound, it's no, Nati. It's a silent. Nati fa. Nati fa. Kowe. And dialect. We say Fano. Another tribe say um, Wano. The different tribal lands across New Zealand were divided by a series of uh, natural landmarks such as rivers, mountains, streams, and even rocks. If one tribe trespassed on another tribe's land without permission, then this could result in a bloody conflict. Hmm. We won't delve too deep into that in this video because we don't want to fall foul of YouTube's community guidelines. And the hierarchy within tribes was super, super important to the Maori. So you basically had a chieftain at the top, a class of aristocrats, a class of commoners, a separate class of experts such as canoe builders and tattooists. More on that shortly. When the Maori arrived in New Zealand, there were large flightless birds roaming the land. Moa. More. More. Uh, more. Ah. Uh. More, ah. They grew up to 3.6 meters tall, that's about 12 feet in old money, and they were absolutely mahoosive beasts. Of course, a bird that large provides ample opportunities to food, so hunting was a popular activity, along with foraging, for early Māori when they settled here. But after 100 years or so, sadly, these birds were all hunted to extinction, which meant that Māori culture had to adapt. They basically started to live a more sedentary lifestyle, focused on farming and whatnot. But this sedentary lifestyle actually also had some benefits. Rather than going out on long hunts into the bush, the Māori could stay home and tend to their crops, which left more time for actually developing cultural activities like tattooing and carving. And it was at this period that Māori culture really started to separate, evolve and grow into its own thing, separate from that of their Polynesian ancestors. Ooh, artsy stuff. This sounds like my cup of tea. On the shore of Lake Rotorua lies a Māori village which you too can visit to learn more about the amazing Māori carving techniques. Wow, 
our reject. Well, we are in an amazingly pretty little village called Ohinemutu. 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 It's in Kaora County. Kaora say mu. Mu. Tu. Tu. The tribe that inhabits this village actually came all the way from Hawaii in 1350 AD, which is a hell of a long time ago. Wow. So why do you think they chose this place? Well, from what I read, it seems that they chose it not just because of its amazingly beautiful views over the lake, but actually for something far more interesting. Because Rotorua sits inside a crater, uh -huh. so all the hills around us is the outskirts of the crater. Oh. And Rotorua floats. So we have a lot of earthquakes, but we don't feel them as much because we float. Oh, okay. Which explains all the steaming vents and boiling hot pools you can see around the village. These were used by the Maori for cooking. You can totally understand why one of the main methods of cooking is underground. Because it cooks it really, really fast because of the geothermal activity. And later by the European settlers for bathing. So this behind me is actually a traditional bathhouse which would have harnessed the geothermal waters. Unfortunately, it appears to be under renovation, but what a great use of this uh, amazing natural resource. Indeed, and if this is your thing, then make sure to visit one of the many hot springs around the area. Dotted amongst the boiling hot pools are the villagers' homes, wooden houses that are clustered around the villagers' meeting house. The meeting house is by far the most important building in any Maori village. Gosh, this is absolutely stunning. It's so, so detailed. Got wood carvings on the outside and inside it's all painted with traditional colors as well it's absolutely beautiful but it says strictly no entry because you have to be invited into a hall like this by the Maori people you cannot walk in how long do you think it took to carve all this um 23 years four months and six days really is that a fact <laughs> apparently the original hall dates back to the 1800s and apparently a lot of these wood carvings could actually be a lot older than that still. In the old days we didn't have pen and paper. Right. So everything um, would have been carved. You can find examples of the Maori's prowess in wood carving all across New Zealand. These grand statues and meeting halls act as a strong visual reminder of the nation's history. Tattooing was another respected Māori art form, but it also served a deeper purpose. The town walker was a form of identity. If you had a, you were in the room, people knew you were recognised by your, by your tattoo. And it was also something that you wore in respect for those whom had passed on before you. The town walker was an expression, it's a story. Each town walker, depending on your family, like my family were all look the same, your family, if you were Māori, would look different. Oh man, what a lovely lady. I just can't get over the fact that people here are just so generous with their time and also so willing to share and are so open about their culture. It's just, yeah, it makes it a lot easier as a tourist to kind of get a better feel for the area. So if you do come here, just take the time, speak to people, and they'll gladly tell you their story. And it will honestly help just really bring this area to life for you. And if talking to people isn't your cup of tea, then this area is absolutely jam-packed with nature spots, many of which have a deep significance to the local Māori. Take, for example, the Blue and Green Lakes, popular spots for both active folk and professional picnickers like myself. The lady at our campsite said that you're not supposed to swim in these lakes unless you are Māori. The Blue Lake, you can walk around, mm -hmm. that's where we have a lot of activity, but the Green Lake is you can't swim in. Okay. Only certain not tribes can. Oh, okay. So I can, but my husband can't. But I don't see any signs, so I'm not sure how other tourists would know that. So maybe have a look and check that out, guys, because you don't want to be disrespecting the local culture. Do you often just go I just will not despite go him? It's too scary. Okay. Because <laughs> in the middle of the island is a cemetery. Right. Oh. So I just don't want to go there. <laughs> so yeah, make sure you follow the rules because, as we later learned, you certainly do not want to anger the local elders. So this is Lake Tarawera. And opposite this looking point where we are is Mount Harawara. Now there was a volcanic eruption and it completely wiped out so many villages and tribes in this area. We used to have these pink and white terraces and people used to come from all around the world and bathe in these terraces. Oh, okay. Because it was healing waters. And because the white people were starting to come over, some of the Maoris were starting to get a bit greedy. So they started charging and the Kaimatuas, the older people, 
did not like that. Okay. Yeah, it's like that is wrong. So one of the chiefs up there, um, something about put a, not a curse, but said something's going to happen. They, they were pre-warned that this was going to happen. So my great 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 uncle <coughs> owned the hotel up there that got squished. The more we spoke to our new mates, the more we realised that local families have an amazing oral storytelling yeah. tradition. So my Ghost grandmother's stories. told me some yeah. stories, <laughs> like some freaky oh. stories, like one of the elders up there put a curse on the family, that no one was going to live over 60. Oh gosh. And one story that you will hear mentioned again and again is the age-old tale of forbidden love. Tanamore and Tutanakai were lovers. Tutanakai was from the island in the middle. Tanamore was a, a princess uh -huh. and the family did not want them to be together. Tanakai would play his flute for Hinimoa, then she would sneak out to be with him. So this is where she used to sit and listen to her lover play the flute across the lake. This is the island that she swam to. She was going to go across to see him mm -hmm. and her father, the chief, heard about it. So they removed all the canoe that she swam to her tani. Hinimoa and Tanakai became one. So this story is like the New Zealand version of Romeo and Juliet. Two star-crossed lovers couldn't be together. But this one ends in happiness instead of death. Spoiler alert, she's just ruined the ending of Romeo and Juliet for everybody. Christ. <laughs> God. I'm sorry, guys. Oops. Yep, sorry about that. Anyway, my favourite story of all is a local legend that explains why some locals have red hair. Intriguing, right? Well, let's go climb a mountain and find out more. Oh no, this is the start of the walk, look. Mm -hmm. right, so yeah, okay. this is the start of the walk. Good thing about living in a van, outfit change. Now I'm ready to hike. I just got changed on the side of the road. All my stuff's with me. Winner. Look how big they are. Oh, this is perfect for a hot summer's day. Legend has it that on this mountain and in some surrounding areas in Rotorua lived a mythical group of people. It's a pet pirates, which are half human, half animal okay. groups, and they've got red hair. Apparently, they would lure Maori girls up into the mountain, take them back up, impregnate them, and send them back down. And that's why some Maori have red hair. So these days, as long as you behave yourself, observe the rules of the forest and stick to the paths, then I think you should be okay. Although I would caution, you should watch out because there are still some hidden dangers. You could easily oh, cut your head off if you're not watching where you're going. Oh, Jesus. Fortunately, the upper part of the mountain was shut today because um, they've had some pretty inclement weather down here in New Zealand these past few weeks, which means a lot of trees fall down. But what they do here, which I think is really cool, is when a tree does fall over the path, rather than removing it, they just basically just chop through it. I mean, so that its uh, carcass can just lie almost untouched, and rot away into the forest, just as nature intended. Something that nobody ever told us before we came to New Zealand was that one minute you'd be walking along and you feel like you're in the midst of a jungle in Southeast Asia or somewhere like that. And then the next minute you come to a clearing, look ahead of you, and it looks like you're in blooming England, doesn't it, missus? Rolling British countryside right in front of here. With some very, very big mountains just behind though. Well, that's New Zealand for you. It really has something for everyone. Be that amazing scenery, fascinating history, or even a McDonald's in a plane. Yep, that's right. In the next episode, we are going to work our way down to Lake Taupo, where we discover a one-of-a-kind fast food restaurant. Subscribe so you don't miss it, and drop a like if you, um, like the video. Bye! You're such a cutie.